Our speaker today is Cindy Tui. Uh, she'll be familiar to many of you from some time ago. She obtained her master's degree and doctorate uh, in atmospheric sciences from the University of Washington. She then uh, joined uh, NCAR as an ASP graduate student and a postdoc working with Al Cooper and Jim Dye, and later uh, became an NCAR scientist in the uh, what at the time was known as the Atmospheric Technology Division, ATD, soon to become EOL. Uh, while there working in uh, the research aviation facility, she did computational fluid modeling for the aircraft and developed aerosol and cloud instrumentation, most notably the counterflow virtual impactor, the CVI, which is still in use now. She uh, has over 30 airborne research projects under her belt on 10 different aircraft since 1987. After she left NCAR, she became a research professor at Oregon State University, and then she's now a senior research scientist at Northwest Research Associates and a visiting researcher at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She is a uh, editor of the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society and serves on the International Commission on Clouds and Precipitation. Focus of her current research is uh, hair and dust and biological particles, how they influence clouds. And that's what she'll be talking about today. So thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to be talking about two different experiments uh, using an aircraft to measure Saharan dust and tropical convection, as well as uh, fluorescent biological particles uh, around here and in the Great Plains region, and trying to learn something about implications for ice nucleation from these measurements. And um, I'm going to, be, the talk is structured as an introduction of a few slides, then we'll be talking about the biological particle measurements and then about the Saharan dust measurements. Um, and it is, even though it's an EOL seminar, it is really a science seminar rather than a technical seminar. So hopefully everybody is okay with that and still wants to stay put for the rest. Um, we're going to be talking about ice and clouds, so just to remind you of the importance of clouds, we know that about 60% of the Earth's area is covered by clouds. They're primarily responsible for the Earth's reflectance, or albedo, which maintains the surface temperature at a comfortable temperature for life. And they're also important in cleansing the atmosphere. They scavenge particles and gases and cycle them back to the surface in precipitation. So they're important for biogeochemical and hydrologic cycles. What about atmospheric ice? Well, ice crystals are present both in cirrus clouds, all ice clouds, as well as in mixed phase clouds, which have droplets. But ice crystals, as you can see from the um, image here that was on the cover of BAMS from the SPEC CPI, are very different from cloud droplets. They tend to be larger, so they're more likely to scavenge material, and they're also more likely to precipitate out of the atmosphere. And they have um, vastly different radiative properties than cloud droplets. Uh, they tend to form at colder temperatures, they are larger, and they have these complex habits. So the amount of ice in clouds really affects a lot of things in the atmosphere. The radiative heating profile, the cloud, cloud's precipitation rate, and the cloud lifetime. And um, just to remind you um, about ice nucleation in the atmosphere, this can occur uh, by two main pathways. The first is homogeneous nucleation, which is freezing of pure water droplets or liquid aerosol particles. And the theory of homogeneous nucleation is fairly well understood. We won't be talking about that today. Um, but there's also heterogeneous nucleation, which is ice formation, which is initiated by a special particle called an ice nucleating particle. They used to be called just ice nuclei, but now the terminology that's um, considered better is ice nucleating particle. Because the whole uh, particle isn't usually an ice nucleus, the nucleus actually take, the nucleation takes place at specific sites, special sites on the particle that are either chemically or physically um, different and that allow ice to begin to form in that uh, area. And ice can form by freezing of liquid um, to solid phase or by deposition, which is actually vapor directly to the solid phase. But the important thing to remember is that these heterogeneous INP, ice nucleating particles, permit ice formation at lower supersaturations and at warmer temperatures in the atmosphere than homogeneous nucleation. And this just kind of is a uh, schematic of the types of heterogeneous ice nucleation, so it starts getting really complicated now. Within these heterogeneous ice um, processes, they can form very differently. Um, here are the little square squares are schematics for aerosol particles in the atmosphere. And in deposition, 
vapor deposits directly onto an aerosol particle and forms ice. Contact nucleation occurs when a particle strikes a cloud droplet and initiates ice formation that way, either from the inside or the outside of the cloud droplet. It's basically happening at the surface. Whereas immersion and condensation are where these particles end up inside a cloud droplet and uh, basically form a site for ice to form um, inside the droplet. The particles are just made of anything? Well, that's the question. So there's only maybe one in a million of the particles in the air in any one time is going to act as an ice nucleus. And so they have to be, they have to have special properties, and we understand some of those properties, but not all of those properties. There are certain types that are better um, at forming ice, certainly, and we're going to talk about that perhaps next. Um, and ice, just to remind you, ice can also be formed by secondary processes in a cloud, um, and this is when primary ice, which is the nucleation that I've been talking about, can actually. Um, um, New, uh, go through processes in which more ice crystals are formed without additional ice nuclei being present. But going back to heterogeneous ice nucleating particles and the types, so mineral dust is one of the types that has been known to be important for a number of years. Um, many of these particles are efficient at temperatures colder than minus 15 C in the atmosphere. And mineral dust has been extensively studied. Then we have biological particle emissions, such as bacteria, spores, pollen, or leaf litter. And here is a puffball mushroom that's actually releasing spores into the atmosphere. And these spores can be carried to pretty high altitudes in the atmosphere. Um, but these particles are um, harder to understand because there's um, only a very small fraction of them that form ice and um, there's a varied amount of these particles in the atmosphere of varied types and as you'll see um, varied in where they occur in the atmosphere. But they're important because whereas mineral dust only acts at colder temperatures below minus 15, some of these biological particles can actually be important at warmer than minus 15 C in forming clouds, or ice and clouds. And then there's ocean emissions and soot or biomass plumes that can also be sources of ice nucleating particles, which we won't be talking about today. Uh, so getting back to mineral dust and biological particles, this is a uh, experimental result from Depres et al, where they're actually um, in the lab looking at temperature versus the fraction of particles that act as ice nucleating particles for different types. And for mineral dust, which is in the black squares here, you can see that it starts forming ice at about minus 15, and as you get to colder temperatures, it becomes starts becoming more and more active um, in ice nucleation. Um, but when we get to biological particles, which are shown in the crosses, you can see that the behavior is um, quite variable. And so we have fungi, pollen, and bacteria from different habitats. And you can see that basically these particles, some of these particles can form ice at really warm temperatures, as, as warm as minus two in some, um, for some particles. But they're all over the book. Some of them very high activity, and there's some that don't form ice at all. So they're variable in ion activity, and their concentrations in the atmosphere are quite variable. But in general, they're, general, they're low, low concentrations relative to dust. So they're hard to measure. Um, difficult, it's a difficult problem, but very interesting. So this first part is going to talk about some measurements we did of these biological particles at temperatures conducive to the formation of mixed phase and cirrus clouds. And I had a number of collaborators. Um, at least three of them which are here in the audience today on this project. And we have an article in a Atmospheric Chemistry and Physics discussion right now if you want to check that out. So to review, we saw that mineral dust and biological particles are known ice nucleating particles, but the, the biological particles may be more important than dust at what I call the warmer sub-zero temperatures. So 
a few degrees, minus 2 to minus 15 to 20. And this just shows you know, some examples of these particle types in the atmosphere. This is Pseudomonas syringae, which is um, known to have ice nucleating characteristics and some other rust spores, which can also um, do this in the atmosphere. So most of the existing measurements that have been made are ground-based, because it's much easier to measure these particles on the ground, of course. Um, and the ground is where the source is. So the question is, these tend to be large particles, generally uh, larger than one micron in size. So how many of them actually reach altitudes where ice is formed in the atmosphere? That was what we were going after um, with this experiment. First, let me just show you an example of um, what aerosol typically, lo what aerosol loading typically looks like in the atmosphere. These are aerosol extinction profiles from a LIDAR at the Southern Great Plains arm site um, as a function of season. So here we have extinction versus altitude for the different uh, seasons in the mean. And here we have extinction versus altitude for autumn and showing uh, plus or minus one, one standard deviation uh, for that season um, in what the profiles look like. And so you see the boundary layer is generally one to two kilometers. And so most of the aerosol, as you expect, is confined to the boundary layer. But interestingly enough, there's quite a bit of aerosol that actually makes it above the boundary layer up to five or six kilometers. And when you look at the temperature profiles, which are shown on the right for the different seasons, it turns out that the altitudes at which temperatures um, occur that we think these biological particles are important are uh, also these altitudes at which we have small amounts of aerosol that seem to be uh, escaping the boundary layer here from about two to six kilometers. And that was just aerosol data, general all aerosol particle extinction. So that could be very different from biological particles themselves, which is this special subset. So we wanted to study this for, specifically for biological particles. And the goals of the study were to test a new compact high rate sensor on the aircraft that's called the Wideband Integrated Bioaerosol Sampler. And this is based on characteristics of these biological particles to autofluoresce. So they give off fluorescent light under certain conditions. And that's what the instrument is measuring. And we wanted to compare, to do this on the aircraft, looking um, at these particles and compare them first to measurements at a previous site, um, the Beacon experiment, which was in 2011. Some of you may have been involved in that, in a Colorado pine forest. And then we wanted to measure these concentrations in and above the boundary layer, particular in the mixed phase cloud regime, as well as higher up where serious clouds form. And we used, uh, we participated in the IDEAS 2013 experiment on the G5 uh, to do this. This was based in um, Broomfield in September and October of 2013. And um, we flew over the Great Plains region as well as a forested site uh, on one day, the Beacon site I mentioned. Um, this just shows the area that we sampled in. So this is a land use map on which we superimpose um, where we sampled for five different flights, uh, which are shown in the different colors. And each of these dots is a 200 second average um, sample, which we took uh, for the WIBS instrument. And you see most of these were over uh, basically farmland, over the Great Plains. Um, and then we had this one flight here where we flew over the Beacon site. So the, ins the instrumentation, as I mentioned, was this WIBS instrument. Um, we also use a counterflow virtual impactor, or CVI, which measures cloud particles only normally. But we actually turned off the counterflow, so we were actually able to do clear air sampling as well and use this as an ambient inlet. Uh, we took filter samples on the aircraft as well as at the Beacon ground site for off-line uh, measurements of ice nucleating particles using um, a, C a technique developed at Colorado State. And this shows the WIBS 4A in the rack and the filter sampler that we used to take these INP measurements. And here, um, one of the goals of IDEAS was also graduate student training. And so we had a wonderful graduate student, Christina McCluskey, who's here, who's taking apart the CVI inlet. Um, and she was actually really instrumental in running the instrument on the aircraft and taking filter samples and doing a lot of, a lot of the effort for this program. 
So thank you for that. Uh, this is just a schematic of the WIBS instrument um, showing how the particles come through the sample flow here. And there's a number of things that goes on. First, they pass through a laser beam and scatter light, and they're counted sized. Um, and then this triggers the UV measurement, which is basically a flash lamp that's firing and illuminating a particle with 280 man nanometer UV light, and then measuring the fluorescent emissions in two different channels. And then the second lamp fires down here and produces 370 nanometer light, and then uh, the particles fluoresce, and um, their emissions are measured in two channels as well. And this is just a, a more detailed picture of the optics of, of the instrument. Um, the sample flow rate's uh, pretty low, about 0.3 liters per minute. The size range is typically 0.8 to 20 microns, which does comprise a lot of the biological material, at least the primary biological material in the atmosphere. Um, but because of the plumbing on the aircraft, we think we're actually getting up to about 10 microns in size through. So the WIBS measures these fluorescent biological particles, which are also called by the community FBAP. Okay, so I'll be using FBAP. These are biologic, well, these are particles that fluoresce, and we think for the most part they're biological. They're usually pretty well correlated with other measurements of biological particles. And uh, there's a number of channels, basically, that are uh, where the data is produced in. The first channel is, used to be called A, but now it's called FL1 is um, a 280 nanometer excitation wavelength and it fluorescing at this wavelength. And this is thought to be indicative of um, things like tryptophan um, and other uh, proteins that are common in biological particles. And then FL3, or the C channel, is um, indicative of things that are uh, going on with cell metabolism like NADH and riboflavin. And then there's this tricky FL2B, which is measured, but it's poorly understood. It's thought to have artifacts uh, with anthropogenic aerosols, and um, it's not included in the data that I'll show that I've shown today. It's a new instrument, so people relatively new, so people are still figuring out what's the best way to actually produce a data set and present the data. Um, and so what I've done is looked at uh, concentrations in two different uh, categories. So I've actually calculated a conservative estimate of FBAP, which are particles that fluoresce in both channels, FL1 and FL3. So they have to have both these fluorescent characteristics to be counted. So there's fewer of them, this conservative estimate. More liberal estimate is particles that fluoresce in channels one or three. So this is gonna be a higher concentration, as you'll see in some of the plots that I show. But before we get to actual data presented, we have to go through the nuts and bolts of correcting these concentrations for aircraft sampling. So the WIBS particles um, larger than 0.8 microns were averaged over 200 seconds because sometimes the concentrations are really low. We have to average to reduce counting statistics um, errors. Um, and then we corrected for the sampling efficiency of the inlet itself, as well as the tubing downstream of the inlet. And we uh, did this in a, uh, with a couple different steps. First of all, we did a computational fluid uh, analysis of the inlet under two different altitude conditions, low and high. And from that, we uh, calculated inlet aspiration efficiency, which is the concentration of particles that are actually entering the inlet as well as losses in the inlet as a function of particle size. So that gives us what's getting through the inlet. And then we have to do what's getting through the tubing. Um, and for that, we used a particle loss calculator pro uh, program. It's a, a German program, uh, IGAR-based program that's really nice if you have to calculate losses through complicated tubings like you tend to have on the aircraft. Um, and from that, we get a net sampling efficiency as a function of particle size and airspeed. And based on what we think are the errors in these various steps, we also have a root sum square uncertainty used for error bars. Okay, so now we'll get to some actual data. This is the 8th October flight over the Manitou Forest, which is the, uh, where the beacon site, where there's a lot of data from 2011 that we can compare to. And you can see it's north of Colorado Springs here in the Manitou Experimental Forest Observatory. Uh, it's a ground-based pine forest site. 
And uh, what we did on this day is we sent someone from CSU to actually go to the site and take uh, filter samples, which are later analyzed for ice nucleating particles, at about one, one meter and 15 meters on a, a small tower. And then we flew the aircraft overhead and measured biological particles with the WIBs, as well as took a filter, or a couple filters actually, to measure ice nucleating particles on the aircraft. So here's some data, finally, um, to show you. You're going to see a lot of plots like this. This is temperature or altitude on this axis versus the concentration of fluorescent biological particles in number per liter. And we have green and purple for our low and high estimates, okay, based on those different fluorescent characteristics that I told you before. Um, and you can see at the higher altitudes, the lower temperatures in this particular case, uh, the concentrations are really quite low. Um, in fact, pretty much zero for this low estimate, and then up to uh, less than one per liter for the even for the purple. But as you get further down, here's the top of the boundary layer. Um, you can see that you start seeing these biological particles increase in concentration. In fact, when you get in the boundary layer, um, you can see they increase quite a lot. And um, this concentration at our lowest altitude, which is about 1,000 meters above the ground, of about 10 to 60 per liter, turned out to be similar to measurements of the Beacon site in 2011 for the summer and fall seasons, which the mean was 17 to 30 per liter published by Schumacher, and this was actually using a, a slightly different instrument, but still based on uh, the fluorescent characteristics of these particles. Um, 6B is a filter that we took uh, at this lowest altitude for ice nucleation characteristics. And this is shown over here. This is kind of a complex plot. Basically, this is temperature versus ice nucleating particle concentration. And our results from our red uh, aircraft filter here, shown in the red circles, and they're compared to the results from the ground-based um, filters, which are in green and uh, the different green triangles. And at least for these colder temperatures, we found that they fall um, pretty close to the ground base, although a little bit lower, which maybe could be expected because we're higher up in the air. Um, and then also, in the gray diamonds, which hopefully you can see, these are plotted measurements from Paul de Mott's continuous flow diffusion chamber, which is a pretty well-known instrument for measuring ice particles um, on the fly. And so these were from the Beacon 2011 um, experiment. And you can see that those also fall in the same range as our filter measurements. And then finally, we took our measured concentrations of 10 to 60 per liter for this lowest um, altitude of FBAP, and we used a parameterization developed by Tobo et al. for the beacon site data, which converts from FBAP directly to ice nucleating particles. And so on this plot, the 10, the lowest, and the, the higher values of 60 turned out to really bound the, um, the other data quite well. So this gave us confidence that the filter samples um, were, were working pretty well on the aircraft and that the IMP that we calculated from the measurements on the aircraft um, seemed to be consistent with uh, earlier data at this site. So this gave us confidence that we could go ahead and do more with the instrument and measure um, FBAP as a function of altitude for um, five flights I'm going to show you here. And this is actually all clear air data. The um, one I just showed you on the eighth is here in the middle. Um, and so you can see that we have a wide range of these fluorescent biological particles. Um, there's a lot of variability between flight. There's even between flights, and there's also even a lot of variability. This is when we were doing circles for a calibration maneuver at a certain altitude. You could see there's a lot of variation even within a certain region. Um, but there's certain things that are fairly consistent, and that's that at the warmer temperatures here in or near the boundary layer, we tend to get 10 to 100 per liter. And then at the cold temperatures, the really cold temperatures up here, we get something like 0 to 1 per liter. Um, but in the intermediate range, which is here where mixed-phase clouds 
um, can occur, we find this high variation. And I've plotted this differently just to kind of highlight that um, effect. Here we have all the data for the lower bound and all the data for the upper bound. And in particular, for the upper bound, you can see this high variability in this temper re temperature regime where we think that these biological particles are important for, or may be important for heterogeneous ice nucleation. So another thing that we did is compare with a global chemistry model. So the global models are starting to include biological particles um, now. And this was um, the EMAC, it's European chemistry model. We did this in conjunction with um, Susanna Burroughs and Miriam Tenarte in Germany. And uh, these are kind of complicated, but this is, so this is three of the five flights I showed you with the green and the purple um, being the low and high biological concentrations that we actually measured. And then the orange and the black are data from the model. And the orange basically are um, two by two degree latitude points um, within the range of the model, um, the high resolution model domain, which is roughly the same area here in which we flew. So these are basically a measure of what the model predicts variability in, in FBAP around this region. And then the black di uh, diamonds are where we actually interpolated the model data to the actual um, place where we measured um, with the aircraft. So what you can see is that there's a lot of, uh, the model does capture a lot of variability across the region. And it captures a general decrease in height which is um, to be expected, but it tends to actually underestimate, for the most part, um, the actual particle concentrations here. And so some of the reasons that we thought why this might be occurring, well, one of the uh, major ones might be that we were sampling in September and October, which is harvest season around here, and it's been documented that harvest um, actually uh, creates a lot of uh, emissions of these particles up into the air, you can imagine, and um, this is not included in the model at all. So this is probably a source that would, um, would not, would, needs to be included if it can be. Also, we found, we did some limited TEM work, and we found a lot of these uh, larger particles tend to just be irregularly shaped organic material, which we think may be leaf litter, so little bits of plants that get lofted in the atmosphere. These aren't, these, some of these can be IN, and these aren't included in the model. And then finally, the model just may not be doing a very good job predicting either convective or long range transport of these particles. Okay, and now this gets where we're kind of having fun with the data. Um, this is somewhat speculative, but it's a start anyway. Can we predict IMP from our actual measurements? So we have this parameterization Tobo et al. that I mentioned before that's developed for the beacon site. And what we're doing is we're taking this, this is FBAP versus INP as a function of temperature, and we're going to use that to, to convert our measurements to INP. And then we have this other parameterization from Cooper, Al Cooper in 1986, which looks at primary ice concentration as a function of temperature for this region and also other areas in the world. He was able to show a fairly strong relationship between temperature and the concentration of primary ice. He's isolated the cases to looking just at primary ice rather than secondary ice in clouds. So, when we do that, we get an interesting plot. So now we have our same green and purple uh, measurements, but now we're not, they're not FBAP. We've actually converted FBAP to INP, INP concentrations. And then the blue are actually the Cooper measurements of what's expected primary ice as a function of temperature or altitude. And uh, error bars, I think, are one standard deviation uh, for the measurements. So what you see is that for certain cases, especially if we believe that our high uh, FBAP values are more representative of actual biological particles, um, that these could be representative of what we expect to see of ice in the atmosphere. But a lot of in a lot of cases, it's not, in, in particular for measurements where 
where these are basically zero that I've plotted as one e to the minus eighth. So another thing we can do is we can say, well, these are clear our measurements. They may not be representative of what's going on on a really convective day. So what about if we take the boundary layer FBAP concentration, so I've took it, taken a mean concentration here, and loft it up above the boundary layer, and convert, then convert that to ice nuclei concentration. And what you find, that's actually these um, kind of ugly yellow circles. <laughs> and you know, it matches up really well with the ice concentrations, and that's a, certainly an interesting result um, to think about and maybe, maybe look further at. And finally, I've got the IMP calculated from a demod at all parameterization, which a lot of people are using now, which is based not on FBAP, but on just large particles. And you can see that in some cases, that also um, can get up to the areas of expected ice concentrations, but not always. So that's really as far as we've gone with this data set for now. The main points uh, so far are these are the first vertical profiles of FBAP over a wide temperature range in the atmosphere all the way um, through the range where mixed phase clouds and cirrus clouds form. And we found uh, they tend to be about 10 to 100 per liter at warmer temperatures in the, atmosphere, in the boundary layer. Um, tend to be zero to one per liter in the middle to upper troposphere at temperatures colder than 255K. And then they're highly variable in this intermediate region, which is actually where we think um, they may be important for ice formation. We saw that the FBAP and IMP measurements are consistent with prior biological and IMP measurements over a forested ground site. And we saw that the global model captured the trends and some of the variability, but usually underestimated the actual FBAP concentrations. And then we predicted um, INP with FBAP, and these were sometimes sufficient to explain the typical concentrations of primary ice, but often not. And we saw that the FBAP can be lifted. If we li allow the FBAP to be lifted from the boundary layer, um, then they can produce significant IMP. And so the instability of the atmosphere may be really important in determining the effect that these particles have in clouds. Um, and I didn't want to get into this, but a lot of people now are looking at submicron sources of INP that are not being measured at all in our uh, WIBS technique. So the further research that we want to do in this area are to look at sources of, vari of this variability in this regime. Why are some days, this is, why is it essentially zero some days, and why could it be as high as 100 per liter other days? Um, Types, the actual types of biological particles right now is just kind of this generic FBAP category. Um, and also, we do have some in cloud data which need to be um, require separate, different kind of processing. And I began to look at that as well. And we do see these, I'll give you this much, we do see these particles in clouds in the region as well. So, does anybody, um, that's the end of the first part. Maybe I should take questions on that now, if anybody has any. Dan. So that was a few weeks after uh, the implement folder from the Right. Um, did anybody look into whether there was a two week, three week post flood uh, enhancement of mold or other stuff from this region? I know, I was worried about that, although I think the first flight that we had, it didn't turn out like anything was very radically different from later on in the project. Right, so we sent, when, what was the day of the flood, do you remember? So yeah, just, just under two weeks later, we sampled. And I remember coming out to get ready for the experiment, you could almost smell that, so that the air was different. <laughs> <laughs> that there were a lot of areas that were moldy. So I'm sure some of that did get in the atmosphere, but whether, you know, it looks like I don't see that this day is particularly higher than, well, maybe higher than the very end of the project, but it doesn't really look higher than this day significantly. You know, we could look at that because the spin up on the model, she started the model the previous year. So we could actually look at that. I don't know. So the model predicts fungal spores, at least based on um, atmospheric humidity. 
So there should be some effect there, but whether it's high resolution enough to really capture. Um, but yeah, that would be interesting to look at to see over what period, if there is an enhancement, and then over what period that occurs, and if it's died down by the time we started sampling. Hey. Right, so a lot of people are looking at um, things that are actually exuded from biological particles, which are uh, carbohydrates or proteins and things that can actually, are their macromolecules that can get ex exuded and they do, they filter the material through a certain size filter and from that and then they subject it to ice nucleation and then they can find out that particles that pass through a point, or that are 0.2 microns and smaller are actually creating ice nucleation in, in the lab. And so there's been a lot of laboratory work on this. There's also a lot of interest in marine um, aerosol particles and um, the organic layer at the surface, and there's lots of organic macromolecules floating around there that are created from the ocean biota that they're finding have ice nucleating characteristics. But whether they get up into the atmosphere and how they get up into the atmosphere, um, possibly through bubble bursting, at least in the marine case, um, is a good question. So, you know, most people have found that ion tend to be larger particles because they have more sites potentially more surface area, more sites potentially for ice to form on. Um, but I'd say that's a really active area of research and we'll, have, we'll just have to see. Yes? Did, did you say that you have in cloud observations as well? I do. So is there, a, do you have like any sort of correlation coefficient between ice Um, yes, I'm, I've looked at that, and sometimes there are and sometimes there aren't, but I haven't completely corrected the data yet for artifacts, which we think we sometimes get in cloud when sampling ice crystals, as well as losses in the plumbing and things, so I don't really want to say um, too much on that score. I don't know if we have enough in cloud data to really answer that question as well. It was kind of spotty. It was a test program, so we were just sampling what we could. Um, but I, I do, I do have that data, and it will hopefully be a future paper. But I don't want to say too much about that right now. I think that we might have to like design a separate experiment to go after that question. Okay, let me move on to the next section. Oh, I went all the way through here. Okay. And this relates to interactions between Saharan dust and tropical convection. And I've got a number of collaborators here from CSU, from NASA Langley. Um, from, we're starting to collaborate uh, with satellite people at University of Wisconsin, and I'm hoping um, to collaborate with Andy Heimsfield and Aaron Bansomer here at NCAR, which they actually got me into this in 2006, um, working in an experiment on the DCA, which I'll show you data from today. So Saharan dust, is uh, very important over the Atlantic Ocean. Here's the coast, west coast of Africa, and you can see there's these giant dust plumes that form over the Sahara, and because of the trade winds, they're brought over the Atlantic Ocean where they can interact with clouds. This is just one example, but we also have climatological data over the oceans from a really nice paper by Heinzenberg looking at dust mass concentrations in different latitude bands, and you can see that the black dust concentration peak here at zero to 15 degrees um, entirely because of the Saharan dust plumes. The Asian dust tends to form at higher latitudes here. Um, and this, these concentrations in these latitude bands are, are much higher than even sea salt uh, mass concentrations over the oceans. And this isn't something new. We actually have this fun quote from Darwin where aboard the Beagle off the coast of Africa in 1823, he said the dust falls in such quantities as to dirty everything on board and to hurt people's eyes. 
Vessels even have run on shore owing to the obscurity of the atmosphere. So how is this important? Well, um, first of all, just these vast quantities, um, they produce something that we call the Saharan air layer, or SOL. And it's this layer of dust that occurs up to about six kilometers off the coast of Africa. And the mineral dust, as we know, acts as an ice nucleating particle in clouds. We also um, know now that it acts as a cloud condensation nuclei due to um, certain components that either adsorb or ad absorb or adsorb water. And so the sol can have indirect climate effects through clouds as well as direct interactions with light just because of all these particles scattering and absorbing light. Um, and finally, the, dust, the deposition of dust to the ocean surface is important because it provides trace elements such as iron and phosphorus that can fertilize the critters in the ocean, the ocean biota. And studies have even been shown that this dust can go all the way across the Atlantic to the Amazon rainforest and fertilize plant life there. Um, there's been a number of studies that show effects of this uh, layer on clouds. Here's a, <clears throat> a different type of satellite uh, product. That This is the Saharan air layer coming off the coast of Africa. And here's a tropical storm. You can see this dust tends to get wrapped around from the north to the western side of these storms and presumably get inside them. And I'll try to convince you that, yes, um, it does with data from two experiments. The first is the NAMA on the DC-8, which is over on the eastern Atlantic. And then we have the PREDICT experiment on the NSFG-5 on the other side of the Atlantic. And we did a, a number of measurements with the counterflow virtual impactor, where we collected drops and ice crystals from these clouds, kind of like what you were suggesting there. We looked at the residual particles and analyzed them via transmission electron microscopy. And the first um, interesting thing we found is that within a liquid cloud, all droplets actually in, embedded in this dust layer, we found 80% of the droplet residuals were what appeared to be pure dust without a lot of other material on them. So it looks like the dust um, can, when it needs to be, act as a cloud condensation nucleus. Then we also sampled anvil ice um, in the NAMA project. These are uh, different samples, different flights, and the percent of residual particles containing dust, either pure dust or dust mixed with other material, we found that was about 30 to 70 percent of the cases, or 30, 30 to 70 percent of the particles by number had dust. And then we also did something similar in this experiment on the other side of the ocean um, in PREDICT, and we found that, that the concentrations of dust in these anvils were, were lower, something like 0 to 50 percent, and more variable, as you might expect, because dust is removed as it, as it goes across the ocean. Um, and I want to just give you one um, example of some of the data that we collected on the DC-8. This is altitude. Um, aerosol scattering ratio from the LAYS LIDAR, which uh, here we're flying along at about 11 kilometers. It's the aircraft track. This is just distance. And um, the LIDAR is measuring the cirrus shield above the aircraft, as well as uh, the dust, deep dust layer below the aircraft. And here, as we approach the actual storm, the LIDAR is attenuated. And we switch to uh, radar data here from a Doppler radar. And we see high reflectivity and updrafts in this region just near where the dust is entering the storm. And we actually took a sample here um, in this area near the, uh, the updraft. And we found, well, not only did we, we encounter an enhanced convection, possibly due to dust affecting cloud microphysics and thermodynamics, which I won't get into today. But we also found that the ice near convection um, contained mostly Saharan dust. And in fact, Aaron at lunch today had taken that filter sample or that um, electron microscopy sample. And he reminded me that when he looked at that sample, he said it was just brown. And so that's another data point, basically, to show that, yes, there was likely dust in this sample. And it's getting up into the anvil. So just uh, talking about how dust is transported and how things change as you go across the Atlantic, this is uh, Calypso data uh, for uh, one month. 
And um, you can see, so these are cross sections from the LIDAR of aerosol extinction at different latitude bands. And uh, basically this is the surface and this is going up to about six kilometers. And you can see that there's a lot of aerosol in this region on the eastern side of the Atlantic, but then as you get to the western side of the Atlantic, it's diminished considerably. You et al. found that about three quarters of the Saharan dust mass has been, had been removed over the Atlantic. And the question that we're looking at is what role do clouds have on these changes? So this is really new research. Our old research was looking at how these dust particles affect clouds. Now we're looking at how the clouds affect the dust particles and affect the saw layer. So we saw that the Saharan dust can enter the droplet and ice phase. Um, many studies have investigated this impact on clouds, but what about the converse? In particular, we're looking at how much dust is transported to the upper troposphere where it can affect cirrus clouds, and how much is removed to the ocean's surface in precip. And this, this can have a direct effect by just removing dust from the atmosphere as well as effect on the ocean biogeochemistry. I'm going to start speeding up to make sure I get through this. Our strategy is to use, utilize a combination of in situ measurements, which I'll be showing you today, regional scale modeling with our colleagues at CSU, and satellite data from the University of Wisconsin. So how much dust is removed to the upper uh, troposphere from the SOL level? We're using in situ measurements from NAMA. We sampled 10 tropical storms off the coast of Africa in various levels of development. This is just an example of one. Here's um, the, the dust moving off the coast of Africa. Dusty air here, typically we have non-dusty air to the south and the storms tend to, to form in this region. And the blue is a flight track. So we were making roughly figure eight patterns in and around and through these anvils. Our base was at the Cape Verde Islands. And we're looking at aerosol properties here in the far field versus the, what I call the near field anvil edge. Um, and I'll show you what that is in the next slide. And we're using, um, from uh, Bruce Anderson's group at Langley, we're using the dry aerosol scattering coefficient, dry particle number and size, as well as the Lay's aerosol LIDAR to identify dust layers below the aircraft. So this is the data selection. Um, we selected clear air aerosol properties at 8 to 12 kilometers. The far field background samples were defined as greater than 40 kilometers from the cloud edges. And we have 61 cases there. Um, then we have what I call the anvil edge samples. These are four kilometer samples right at the edge of the anvil as we're going into the cloud. And they're screened so that there's no ice crystals. So we've looked at multiple cloud measurements to make sure that we're actually in the clear air just at the anvil edge. We looked at four kilometer increments, which is 20 second average samples going away from the cloud edge. And finally, we looked at the LIDAR to identify which cases we could uh, determine had, were likely to have dust influence. And we have eight of these 32 cases based on the LIDAR. <clears throat> where dust was um, possibly influencing the clouds. So here's the um, data that we got, which is really interesting, I think. Um, so these are um, whisker plots of, first of all, our far field background, and then our cloud edge for all, all 32 cases, and then our cloud edge for the eight um, dust cases. And here we have aerosol scattering coefficient from a nephilometer. And here we have particle concentration larger than 0.3 and larger than 0.7 microns from an optical particle counter. And so you can see um, for the scattering coefficient, things are maybe most dr dramatic. The background is essentially at the detection level of the instrument, very low um, scattering here. But when we get to the cloud edges in both the, all the cases and in, especially in the dusty cases, we see this jump up, with it, uh, the median value here being considerably higher than the background. And then we see also for just looking at the particle number concentration, um, not so much difference actually here from the background to all the cases. But when we look at the dusty cases, we see uh, quite a large increase in large particle concentration. And interesting, the largest um, the outliers here at the very highest particle concentrations turned out to be from the tropical storms. Tropical Depression Helene, which became a hurricane, and Tropical Storm Debbie. And then finally, this shows it just for even larger particle sizes with a larger shift in the median size for the dusty cases. 
So the concentration of large particles is higher at the anvil edges, especially in the dusty cases, with a median about four to eight times higher than the background. And the median increase for particles larger than 0.3 microns in size is about 0.3 per cubic centimeter, which may not sound like much, but this is actually 300 per liter, which is a significant number when you start talking about ice clouds in the atmosphere. And these are some size distributions. So here we have particle diameter versus number concentration for the background air and then for the cloud edge air. And you can see that the concentration, once you get in these large particle sizes, is enhanced. And this is just the ratio of large particles, um, or the ratio as a function of particle size for the dusty cloud edge to the background air. So we get these considerable enhancement in large particles. And here's another case later in the project where we didn't have the small particle concentrations available, but for the large particles, you can see again, you can get pretty strong enhancements in these dusty cases. Up to 10 to 60 times more, num more numerous for the one micron particles. And how far does, from the anvil edge does this, part, this enhancement extend? So what I showed you before was just for the cases closest to the anvil edge. But then as you go further and further away, you can see things drop off out to about 10 kilometers. So the enhancement extends about 10 kilometers from the cloud edge. And interestingly, this is um, the, about the distance at which satellite studies also see enhanced backscatter near clouds. And this has been called the halo or transition zone. But the satellite measurements are, are complicated um, for a number of reasons. But primarily here, I wanted to mention that they are affected by humidity near clouds. We were measuring dry. So we brought the particles in the aircraft, dried them to less than 10% humidity. But typically, humidities near clouds um, increase. And so aerosol extinction increases as the particles swell. And the satellites see that. We're not looking at that. This is not a factor in our measurements. So these are real increases in particle concentrations near clouds. So is this important in terms of depleting the sol? We saw an enhancement in large particles of about the median 0.3 per cubic centimeter from storms impacted by dust. And this is a size distribution for the NAMA project for uh, typical uh, dust concentration within the sol layer. And, um, most of this is dust because the particles are non-volatile. And if we look at just the particle concentration above 0.3 microns in the sol, it's typically something like 90 per cubic centimeter. So 90 versus 0.3, it looks like transport to the upper troposphere isn't very significant in terms of modification of the sol number concentration. But is it important in terms of ice nucleation? So we saw this enhancement of about 300 per liter at the dusty anvil edges. Um, and I just wanted to mention that this is within the range of what we measured via electron microscopy and optical particle counter actually in the NAMA anvils in terms of um, actually different storms. We, um, we measured anywhere from 60 to 3,800 dust particles per liter in the anvils. But about 300 per liter are coming out. How many of these are likely to be ice nucleating particles? Well, we don't know for sure. We can estimate this with Demott et al, who has a parameterization for immersion freezing um, based on his CFDC measurements. And at minus 30 to minus 35, we can, get, we can assume that something from about 6 to 60 per liter may be actually uh, ice nucleating particles. And actually, at colder temperatures for deposition nuclei, they're likely to be even more effective. In situ, serous concentrations for NAMA was, were only about 40 to 190 per liter. So we're getting into the range here where these, it looks like these particles may be important for serous formation in the region and possibly downstream. But this would be an area of further study to see, really see whether these particles are moving downstream and possibly getting all the way across the, um, the Atlantic to influence clouds in our neck of the woods. OK, this is almost the last science result. Um, dust removal, I just want to mention this. Dust removal to the ocean by precipitation. We're looking at that. this with modeling. Obviously, this is hard to measure. So there's a paper 
that uh, Steve Herbener at CSU has just submitted doing sim model simulations of the RAMS regional cloud model of Tropical Storm Debbie, one of the ones we sampled. Um, and the neat thing is that we now have dust particles acting as both CCN and isonucleating particles using the latest parameterizations, and we're tracking where the dust goes through the storm with a model, which I don't think has been done before. And we're actually seeing how much dust gets removed in rain by the model. And what he found is that about 75 times the dust mass was removed to the surface versus what was lofted to the upper troposphere. And what was predicted by the model to be lofted is similar in concentration to what we actually measured. Um, and why is that the case? Well, this is a cross-section, altitude versus distance for a paper in, prepara in preparation for an idealized storm. And the contours here are the actual dust mass within hydrometeors blacks the updraft region. And so the highest concentrations are actually here being rained out um, below the updraft in, into the ocean surface. And the, low, you know, the concentrations that actually reach the anvil are relatively low because they seem to be effectively, efficiently removed by precipitation. So we think that when dust acts as a CCN, it's nucleation scavenged and removed in rain at the lower levels. But not all of it. Some of it apparently makes it up to the upper troposphere. So the main points here, Saharan dust was found in cloud droplets over the Atlantic and is the dominant particle type in ice in anvil ice near Africa. Particles larger than 0.3 microns are about four times more numerous at the anvil edges of storms with dust below versus the far field and even larger enhancements for larger particles. A median increase of about 300 per liter and this doesn't seem to have, we don't think this has uh, much of an effect on the dust loading of the sol itself, but these added ice nucleating particles in the upper troposphere are likely to influence cirrus cloud development. Uh, the modeling suggests that the removal of dust through nucleation precipitation scavenging is more significant to the sol evolution. Um, about 75 times more dust mass is removed to the surface. And finally, in, in process, we want to put all this together, aircraft data with the modeling, with satellite measurements of Calypso, seeing if we can see possibly dust plumes um, detraining from clouds to provide a more integrated and quantitative picture of cloud impacts on dust crossing the Atlantic. OK, and I'll stop here with just putting up a list of related papers for about the biological area and the Saharan dust. Um, studies. Thank you very much, Cindy. Do we have a time for some questions? Now, perhaps I missed this, but uh, I didn't quite figure out why, these, uh, why there's enhanced large particles outside the convective clouds uh, for this case. Right, so I think these are evaporating ice crystals. So the nuclei, so the, the dust is moved up. They're getting into the ice crystals. Then, then at the edges, they're detraining and evaporating. It was sub, the air was typically subsaturated with respect to ice. And so they're just moving them up and out. Even out at uh, 10 kilometers. Hmm. OK. And we're trying to, the, the effect, though, does not extend out that far. We think some of them are some, there's probably some sedimentation going on and some subsidence going on. So the question is, it'd be really interesting to track them further and see where they're going from there. Mary. So I have a question about the, um, the question in the respect that you said that there was evidence that of dust in the liquid water droplets. And so did you do that? Do you know that it makes it a condon cloud condensation nuclei because you took the measurements in the updraft region where only condensation's happening? No. Or could these possibly have been melted ice particles? No. So this was a special cloud that we found. Actually, it was an alto cumulus cloud that was um, solely liquid. It was a layer cloud. It was at uh, zero degrees C. There was no ice above. There was, it was just a layer cloud. And we had no large, 
uh, precipitation sites droplets, so we know that the CVI was not, that nothing was breaking up, and so each of these residual droplets that we were collecting and evaporating, 80% of them had individual dust particles within. And they're clay minerals, so we think they adsorb water even without soluble material actually um, necessarily on top of them. So clay minerals have bonds that actually grab water. And it's more of an adsorption surface process rather than an absorption, typical CCN kind of behavior. And there's been a couple papers on that by Nennis. And if you look at, you can assume it's, a, so it's equivalent to a kappa value of 0.1, something like that, and you can get them to activate. So I mean, I think they'd be better CCN if they had if they were mixed with soluble material. But we found in this region, which is probably doesn't have a lot of other sources of CCN, um, that if the updraft strengths are enough, that they actually get activated. And certainly in tropical storms with strong updrafts, they would get activated. Yeah. Can I ask another question? <laughs> so you made sort of reference to these really high particle concentrations and. Tropical Depression, Helene, and Tropical Storm, Debbie. So that kind of brought me to the question of, do you see a, correlate, a variation with the stage of the storm? So if it's a younger storm, there might be higher dust particle concentrations than an older storm? You mean because of removal? Yeah. We haven't looked at that. I don't know, Andy, where's Andy? <laughs> oh, he might have some idea of that. Um, there have been people who have looked just more in general at storms that were impacted by dust and whether they had different characteristics. And it's complicated because in some ways, dust can invigorate storms by providing additional CCN and additional freezing at upper temperatures and increased latent heat. I think this is a you know, convective invigoration process. But then the saw layer actually tends to be really dry, has high wind shear, and so this has the opposite effect. So it's pretty complicated to sort those out. And some people think, well, maybe the dust doesn't even get to the center of these storms. But it certainly gets into the storms enough that it's coming out of the anvils. So. Do we have any more questions? If not, let's again thank Cindy. And I thank you all for coming.